One might expect the king of kings to return home in regal splendor, on a golden chariot with servants at his feet. His neck adorned with jewels, his head with a sparkling crown, making his worth known to all, demanding praise and attention. But no, not this king. He returns to his birthplace the same way he entered, not in extravagance, but in humility. He is riding on a donkey in simple clothes. This humble act is a deliberate choice. It's a way of relating to us. Our king doesn't stand aloof or look down upon his people with entitlement. He walks among us, understanding our struggles and embracing our humanity. As we envision his humble entry, we witness his true character shining through, even in his final moments. As he enters his last days on an ordinary dirt path, he is preparing for a glorious triumph over sin and death. His love and mercy soon to wash over all sin. Join together in laying down a palm branch, welcoming our king and proclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Today marks the first day of Passion Week. Holy Week is really, really important because it was all about this week. Jesus came for one reason and one reason only. It wasn't for the miracles. It wasn't for the feeding of the 5,000. It wasn't to walk on water. It was, pay, it was to pay the price on Calvary's cross for you and I. His body would be broken and his blood would be shed for you. His love was to be expressed by going to the cross willingly for you. See, the simplest gospel message is that Jesus loves you and he showed his love so much and so great by going to Calvary's cross because he loved you first. His grace toward you was extended, and it's not a grace you could earn, nor did you deserve, but it's because he loved you first. And as we celebrate today, Palm Sunday, the representation of the end of Jesus, his incarnate ministry here on earth, he enters into Jerusalem lowly, humble, as a righteous king, not on a horse, but on a donkey. He comes not with the fanfare of a big... Uh, Horses and chariots, no, the Bible says that he comes in lowly on a donkey, fulfilling prophecy. See, who was Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth was a person who rocked the religious people of Israel since his birth, which he was visited by foreign dignitaries. Imagine this, your next door neighbor has a baby and all of a sudden the king of Saudi Arabia shows up to greet them. You would remember that name. You would say, who is this guy that just got the king that traveled from halfway around the world that brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh? See, since Jesus' birth, he was all about disrupting the, uh, the religious. He was all about disrupting the norm. And his very presence on planet Earth disrupted everything. And from his very birth, where Jesus would be born in a manger in Bethlehem, lowly in a barn, he was visited. The, the shepherds saw the angels and the dignitaries came with the frankincense, gold, and myrrh. And everybody knew from that day, something is up with this guy named Jesus. Jesus at 12, year old, at 12 years old, he's at the temple teaching. He worked as a carpenter with his father. John the Baptist prophesied. He was the one who was coming who would take away the sins of the world. Jesus appeared as John is baptizing, and John declares he is unfit to tie his sandals. Jesus is then baptized by John, and the voice from heaven speaks, saying, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit falls upon him in the form of a dove, and then at that point he starts an earthly ministry. Three years of disrupting everything they knew. His miracles disrupted the natural. He calmed the storm. He fed the 5,000 and he walked on water. It disrupted the sickness of this earth. Miracles that healed. He healed the man with leprosy. Sight to the blind. He, gave, he healed the woman with the issue of blood. He helped the Roman centurion's servant. And he also healed the 10 men with leprosy. Then he also defeated death by raising Lazarus, Jairus, his daughter, and the widow's son. See, Jesus came to do all those things, but that's not why he came. That wasn't his only purpose. His purpose was for you. 
on this Palm Sunday understand what this was about. Jesus went to Jerusalem willingly, knowing that he would die, knowing that his only purpose was to be broken and his blood to be shed, and you were on his mind. May we never forget the importance of what Palm Sunday is and Holy Week's all about. See, the Bible makes it so clear that it's important. Out of 89 chapters in the Gospels, 29 are assigned to Holy Week. Out of 89 chapters in the Gospels, 29 are assigned to Holy Week. Two-fifths in the book of Matthew, three-fifths in the book of Mark, one-third in the book of Luke, and half of the book of John is assigned to Holy Week. See, this is what all came. The miracles were good, but that's not why he came. The feeding of the 5,000, great. They left fed, but that's not why he came. Jesus came for one purpose and one purpose only. See, we understand clearly that this time, see, you have to understand this scripture. It says, in the fullness of time, There's something really important in that scripture, meaning in the perfect time Jesus came, and this perfect time was prophesied for thousands of years. Daniel would prophesy the exact day of Palm Sunday thousands of years before Jesus ever showed up. Daniel would prophesy and whisper the exact day. Mathematically, he gave you the exact day that Jesus would show up. Zechariah told you the very way he would walk down on a donkey. And you would see time and time and time again through the prophetic utterances from Genesis to Malachi that this day was the most important. That this week would be the most important. That Jesus coming into Jerusalem was for one reason, that his body was broken and his blood was shed. But he foretold it in the Passover. If you have a Jewish friend, you know that Passover is coming soon. Or it already came. And Passover was just... The precursor, it was just the preview of what it was really about. What was Passover? Passover is when the nation of Israel was taken out of their slavery by the hand of God, by the ten plagues. And the tenth plague was what? The tenth plague was? Come on, I don't want to do all the talking today. Thank you. The firstborn... The firstborn would have been killed by the angel if there was no blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And they would pick... On the 10th day of Nisan. Nisan, not the car, but the month. (laughs) There is a month named Nisan in the Jewish calendar. I don't even like Nisan, so if it was up to me, it would be the 10th day of Audi, but whatever. (laughs) On the 10th day of Nisan, during the Passover time, they would pick the lamb without spot or wrinkle to sacrifice. And the blood of that lamb would be put on the doorpost and when the judgment angel, when the angel of death would come across, he would look and say, on the doorpost is the blood. I will not judge, I will forgive, and I will move past. But that's nothing but a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. See, Jesus would be the perfect lamb without spot or wrinkle, whose blood has been put to our account. And when judgment came, God would see, not us, but the blood. And the blood would be the very reason he would look upon us and forgive us. Not by something we did, but by what Jesus did on Calvary's cross. But he would start that on Palm Sunday. And the same day that they would pick the tenth of Nisan, the Passover lamb, guess what day Palm Sunday fell on? The tenth of Nisan. The Passover time you would pick. Jesus being the perfect lamb would be the one who would willingly go and be the lamb for the sacrifice for you and I. That we would be forgiven, that we would know redemption, that we would know freedom, that we would know hope. He would be the perfect lamb. Willingly, he would go. In the Jewish calendar, there would be three reasons why the Jews from around the countries would have to come back to Jerusalem to celebrate. There would be three unique celebrations it would be the, the Feast of Pentecost. That's where we get Pentecost Sunday from. Celebration of booths. And then finally, the Passover. And Jesus would be coming in at the beginning of Passover when all the Jews from around the area would come back to Jerusalem. That would be like if I could ask all the Puerto Ricans to come back to Jersey City. Okay, all the Puerto Ricans, you've got to come back every July 1st. And so Puerto Ricans from Florida, Puerto Ricans from Belleville, Puerto Ricans from New York, all had to come back. 
you know how it would fill up, right? It would be artificially a large number, but it would still be a large number. And the same way there was that very call to Jerusalem in Passover. It would be filled with Jews from all over the area. And Jesus would go, remember, Scripture says, in the perfect time. In the perfect time. In the perfect time. Do you understand that the gospel was at the perfect time when the disciples and the apostles would go out after the resurrection of Jesus? Do you know that the Roman roads were established? And if it wasn't for the Roman roads, they could not get out. The Roman roads still last today. Go on the turnpike and see how theirs is lasting. The turnpike is falling apart, but the Roman roads are doing well. They did it good back then. They must have not had unions. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I kept that to myself. What happened? It was in the perfect time the gospel came. And Jesus paid the price for you and I. See, when the Passover was celebrated, they all understood the concept of there must be a shedding of blood for the remission of sin. They all understood that there must be something innocent to die so that us who are not innocent can be redeemed. And Jesus would make that clear that he would voluntarily go to be the lamb without spot or wrinkle to the sacrifice for you and I. It says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, speaking about the Passover, it says, on that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and the firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the house where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. How many are thankful that the blood of the lamb is above the doorpost of your house and when judgment comes, it passes by? It's because of the blood of the lamb that you and I, that the Bible says that if we close our eyes on this side of eternity, we can open up in the presence of God to be absent with the body, to be present with the Lord. And I could only stand on that promise because of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. Today on Palm Sunday, it matters. It matters what Palm Sunday and Holy Week meant. It is for the Christian to understand that these events are not just nice stories we tell in Sunday school, but your history, what happened, the story of your salvation. See, what's very interesting is before Jesus would enter Jerusalem, you would hear a story of a woman by the name of Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Jesus would be at dinner, and Mary, who was overwhelmed with what Jesus had done. If you remember the story, just a couple chapters before this, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And Mary being overwhelmed with joy when Jesus is at dinner, she can't control her worship. How many people during worship today, you just couldn't control it? You're like, God, you're holy, you're amazing, you're wonderful. See, that overwhelming feeling came over Mary too, and she had to worship the king. And the Bible says that she unraveled her hair and took an alabaster box and poured out the perfume all over Jesus' feet and washed his feet with her hair and the tears. See, she worshiped the Lord with everything. She held nothing back. She actually was more, she was undignified because if you know anything about Middle Eastern women, they don't show their hair. But she did. Because she looked at her Savior and said, I have to give him the best worship. I have to give him everything. It cost me everything. That amount of perfume, today's dollar, $12,000. Her hair unraveled, washing the feet of Jesus. So right before Jesus even gets to walk into Jerusalem, Mary has already anointed his feet, has already worshipped him with everything. And scripture says in Matthew 21, at the beginning of Palm Sunday, this is how it went down. And by the way, this event is recorded in all gospels. So your homework for this week is read all the accounts of the gospel of the triumphal entry this week. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. 
All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughters of Zion, Behold, your king is coming lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt and a foal. So just to give you context, if you're a king coming in to enter a town and you're coming to take it over, you would come in on a charger, a horse. That's where we get the Dodge Charger for us city people who have no idea what that was. Dodge Charger is really a horse. Well, not the Dodge part, but the Charger part. (laughs) And so you would come on a horse and you would declare your kingship. But Jesus didn't do that. He came on a humble donkey, on a little donkey. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we kind of laughed when we found out that Absalom got killed off his mule, right? Like, how did he die on a mule? We always thought that story was with a horse, but no, Absalom died on a mule. Well, in the same way, Jesus came on the back of a donkey, humble, lowly. He entered his earthly ministry, humble and lowly, in a manger in the middle of Bethlehem. No fanfare, nobody there to celebrate him. And he'll end the same way humble and lowly, but what's very interesting is that week Jesus declared his Messiah, the fact that he was Messiah. The week of Holy Week is actually really important. We see his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He surveys the temple. On Monday he returns to Beth. On Sunday he goes back to Bethany. On Monday he curses the fig tree. He cleanses the temple. I love that Jesus. He flips tables. Jesus flips tables. A lot of times we like to make Jesus out to be a hippie with a toga. That's not Jesus. I want you to realize something. The Bible's very clear how he comes in the first time on a donkey, but in Revelation 19, he's not coming back on a donkey. He's coming back on a white horse with a tattoo and a sword and fire in his eyes. And so he might come peacefully lonely the first time, but the second time it's not going to be so peaceful. My man's got a tattoo on his leg, fire in his eyes, and a sword out of his mouth on a white horse. He's declared his kingship. That's Jesus. We see on Monday, he returns to Bethany. On Tuesday, he debates with the religious leaders. The Olivet Discourse on Wednesday, we call it Silent Wednesday. We don't know what happened on Wednesday, but Judas makes the arrangement for the betrayal. On Thursday, it's the preparation for Passover. He has the Passover meal, the upper room discourse. He establishes the communion table. Then he goes to the garden, and then we get to Friday. By the way, this Friday is Good Friday service. You should all be here, 7 p.m., Good Friday. You should be here because we're going to participate in communion. The term communion in the original wording uh, in the Latin is called Eucharist. We translate that to thanks. It's the ability to stop and say thank you. We stop and we look at the elements of the communion, the juice and the bread. And we look at the broken body and the shed blood, and Lord, we say thank you. Let us continue in Matthew. So it says, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Others, the road, the multitude who went before him and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? The Bible doesn't miss words. It says the whole city was moved. It says the whole city was moved. So the multitude said, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Dalton, if you could do me a favor and ask the ushers if they could bring in the, uh, the palms. What's happening here is Jesus is Jesus is clearly aware of what's happening. He is entering in. He is entering. I'm sorry. I just heard that door hit. I'm trying to not laugh right now because I know that they're trying to block people. But okay, moving along. So, <laughs> so Jesus is entering into the town. And as he's going in, they're taking the palms and they're throwing it down and they're putting their jackets. And this is not the first time we see this. We see this in 1 Kings. This is not the first time we see this. You can give them out, Jose. Thank you. You guys can give them out. These palms that you see the ushers are giving out, this is what they would give out and they would put on the floor. And they would put it on the floor as a place of 
hey, we're honoring the king. This is not the first time we see this. In Kings, it was done. When the king would come in, they would lay down, and they would say, take this palm or put it on the floor in front of the, the, the horse so that we can show that we respect them. They would take off their jackets. How many people remember the old movies that they, you would never let a lady walk through the puddle? So what would they do? They would take off their jacket. Some of these young guys are like, they do what? They would take off their drip thing and throw it on the floor. (laughs) Yes. In the olden days, if a woman had to walk across a puddle, a man would take off his jacket and lay it so that she wouldn't walk through. Can we bring that back, men? Can we bring back some chivalry, please? (laughs) Guys, guys, bring back some chivalry. It'll make getting married much faster and easier. (laughs) Just random plug by pastor. I'm unashamed about it. Yeah, take off your jacket. It's okay. It's all right. Moving along. Sorry. What would happen is they would take down the palm or they would take off their jacket and throw it in front of the donkey or the horse as a way of surrender saying, here we establish this person is worthy of our praise, worthy of our honor. And they would lay down these palms or they would lay down their jacket in a way of saying, hey, we honor and worship you. But what's more telling is the thing they're saying. They're saying something very clearly. They're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Wait a minute, who is, this, who is this stepdad? Joseph. So why in the world are they saying David? Oh, they exactly know who Jesus is. They are declaring that's Messiah. They've heard their whole life that Messiah will come from the line of David. Remember, we've been, we've been in a series of, with David for months now, right? From November till two weeks ago. And the line of Messiah would come from David. So when they would declare Hosanna to the son of David, they exactly knew what they were declaring. Hosanna to Messiah. And the term Hosanna is not just a praise. We think Hosanna is praise. But Hosanna is a very clear statement in the original language. It means save now. Hosanna means save now. So what are they saying? Messiah, save now. But what do they want saving from? They're in the middle of, hey, kid, you know there's nothing new under the sun? Do you know that political turmoil was a headache back then too? Not that it is now. It's been great lately. I love politics this season. Um, <laughs> hey, can I just remind you that Jesus is on the throne? Who cares who's in the White House? It's time that Christians get back to that. I'm tired of watching Christians play political nonsense when you're supposed to be Team Jesus. I don't care if you're red, you're blue, you're purple, you're green. You're Team Jesus. And he's the one that's in control. He's the one that's on the throne. And it's his, his way. God uses unholy and holy people to get his way across. And he used a Darius and a Cyrus at one time. He used a Nebuchadnezzar at one time. And he's used King David at one time. I don't care who's on the throne. I know who's in control. Just be reminded. I don't know where I was before. Hold on. All right. Hosanna, save now. They're screaming, Hosanna, save now. Save from who? Save from the Roman opposition that was on them. At that time, the Jews were oppressed by the Romans. They were living under the Roman thumb. They, they had to give taxes to Caesar. They had to live with the oppressing Roman guard walking up and down the street. And they thought their Messiah would be the one to free them from Rome. They said, we're going to worship this guy because he's the Messiah that's going to save us from the Romans. But Jesus didn't care about the Romans. He cared about their sin. He wasn't there to save them from the Romans. He was there to save them from their sin. And so when they were screaming, save now, save now, it was a self-serving declaration. They were, have you ever received a boomerang uh, compliment? You know what a boomerang, I've coined this word, so you probably never heard of it. A boomerang compliment is when I'm giving you a compliment just so it comes back to me right after. (laughs) Like looking at you going, man, you look really good. (laughs) Waiting. (laughs) My wife got me a new jacket. Thank you very much for those who are. (laughs) It's a boomerang compliment. And what they're screaming is, Hosanna. They're not giving him praise. It's a boomerang compliment. They're saying, Hosanna, save now. We really don't care about you, Jesus. We care what you could do for us. We want Messiah to save us. We want Messiah to change our circumstance. And what's amazing 
about those palms that you hold in your hand. They would throw them on the floor, but that same crowd in just a couple days would be screaming what? Crucify him. Well, what is, how did that happen? Because the palms they held in their hand represented what they want from Jesus and only what he could do for them, not how they could serve him. And so many times the palm represent your worship. A lot of times we only worship God when things are good. We've made God out to be the spiritual vending machine. We only worship God when things are going the way we want them to go. And we'll take our palm and we'll scream Hosanna or some type of other praise. But the reality of it is, is you'll see clearly here that he doesn't save them from what they want. He saves them from what they need. He doesn't save them from the oppressing government of Rome. He saves them from the oppressing institution of sin. He doesn't save them from what the Romans can do. He can save them from what they're doing to themselves. They get this term, uh, Hosanna, from Psalms 118, verse 25. It literally says, save now. I pray, O Lord, I pray, O Lord, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. They're declaring Psalms 118. They're saying it with the understanding that it's all about what this Messiah could do for them. They would chant, save now. They would chant, save now. And in the book of John, John records four unique in individual groups in this crowd. John 12, 16 says it like this. He just, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard he had done these signs. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. In verse 16, we have the disciples who believed. In verse 17, we have the witnesses to Lazarus' resurrection. In verse 18, the people who heard about what had happened. And in verse 19, the Pharisees who wanted to kill Jesus because they were afraid of what it would cost them. See, there was four groups in the crowd. And what's interesting is the Bible says all of them were throwing down palms but they didn't really mean it. Their worship was self-serving. The worship was boomerang worship. It was all about what they can get for themselves. See, the quality of your worship, that palm in your hand can be something very telling or very damning. The palm in your hand might represent the quality of your worship. Are you only worshiping God because it serves you? Are you only worshiping God because you're getting out of God what you want? See, that palm can turn into a crucify him very shortly, as those people found out. They threw palms and jackets down, and just in a couple of days, they would scream crucify him because they didn't get what they wanted from him, as opposed to asking what he wants from them. Too many times we go to the Lord and we, got, we ask the Lord, Lord, I want you to serve me, not me serve you. He would remind them, in the book of John, verse 12, verse 23, it says this, Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their lives in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it in eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. He throws it down to them. He says, look, you threw down your palms, but this is what I really want. A heart surrendered. You guys are good at being religious. Listen, they've learned how to be religious at this time. They even knew the Psalms. They knew their Sunday school Psalms. They knew the verses. They knew how to be religious. He goes, I don't care about your religion. I don't care that you could say Hosanna. I care about the condition of your heart. Jesus always upped the ante. He's, he would look at the religious elite. He goes, look, good, you know your Torah, good. You know the Passover, good. You follow all these things. You even tithe. But I don't care about that. I care about your heart. And on this Palm Sunday, the palm in your hand can be the reflection of your heart. Are you throwing down palms just to say, Lord, save me? Lord, 
I want it all to go my way. Or Lord, I surrender to you and your way. Scripture makes it so clear. He throws down the gauntlet to them. He tells them clearly, those who love their lives will lose it. Those who care nothing for their lives in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And the Father will, the father will honor anyone who serves me. Now, I need you to catch this next part. It says this. Jesus says, now my soul is deeply troubled. You know the Jesus here on earth, the incarnate ministry of Jesus? He was fully God, yet fully man. There's some who believe that he like hovered on this earth. He had no feeling. No, the Bible actually paints a very different picture. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was tired. He, remember, he slept on the boat. He was hungry when he was, when he was tempted. He was, he was thirsty even on the cross. He was fully human. But yet, as a person who was fully human, he had human emotions. If you remember, even at the story of Lazarus, remember, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. What was that about? It was about the events of Lazarus' death and his sister's heart. He empathized with the sisters. He empathized with those that were suffering over Lazarus. He felt what we feel. And even Jesus here would show his own humanity. He says, and now my soul is deeply troubled. Jesus himself struggled at his own assignment. He knew what was coming. He knew what was coming. Listen to his response. He goes, now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. I need you to catch that. Jesus declares, this is the reason I came. I didn't come to multiply the bread and the fish. I didn't come to walk on water. I didn't come to heal the centurion's daughter. I didn't come for those. Those were all pluses. That's nice. But the reason I came was to be the salvation of the world by the shedding of my blood on Calvary's cross, that he would be whipped, he would be beaten, he would be broken, he would take the death of a sinner for you and I, that you and I might find redemption, that you, might, you and I might find forgiveness, that you and I might find healing. That's why he came. He says it. Should I pray that this goes away? No. This is the only reason why I came. This is why I came. But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do it again. What's very interesting to me is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see the Father's affirmation at his baptism. We see Jesus getting baptized and remember what happens at the end of his baptism, there's a voice from heaven that says what? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And at the end of his ministry, you see the father saying, I have, then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I'll do it again. Twice you'll see the father's affirming work over Jesus. Even Jesus himself needed to be strengthened by the words of God during hard times. Some of us, we make ourselves super spiritual humans that don't need the affirmation of the father. Get with it. You're not that strong. You need God. There's too many people, we think we could do it on our own. We think we have our own strength. If Jesus himself, when he was on planet earth, needed the Father's affirmation, how about you? Some of you, you've convinced yourself, I'm not good enough. I'm never going to get it right. My sin is, too, sin is too bad. My past is too horrible. My, I'm too messed up. I'm too broken. But the Father's affirmation is for you. He's a good and forgiving God. On this Palm Sunday... Mark told me he had given his life on a Palm Sunday, what year? 1997. I look at it in the audience, some of you weren't even born. Okay. <laughs> right, because he's a 35 with seniority. May today you hear the words that you are worthy of his love. Not because of something you did, but because the Bible says he loved you first. And he expressed his love by going to Calvary's cross for you because he loves you. There is no sin too bad, no past too great that you can't be forgiven by a God who loves. See, he affirmed even Jesus in his ministry and he's here to affirm you.
that you are worthy of his love. Jesus went to Calvary's cross so that you would hear the words, for God so loved the world, that who would ever believe in him, you would have everlasting life. Today on this Palm Sunday, the palm in your hand represents the quality of your worship. The palm in your hand represents, there are some people who held the palm like that 2,000 years ago, and they would lay it down on the floor because they really wanted to give boomerang worship. Save me, as opposed to how can I serve you? Today, I want you to understand something clearly as the worship team makes their way up. That there is no sin too great, no past too bad that you can't be forgiven. I want you to know today that Jesus went willingly on that donkey down the hill to Jerusalem. And he went willingly so that you might find forgiveness and peace. He went willingly to Calvary. At the very foot of the cross, he would say these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He would even think about others while they beat him, while they whipped him, while they punched him. He would look and say, Father, forgive, because that's the character of our God. He is a loving God that gives hope and freedom to the hopeless and those that are bound. Today, the work of Calvary's cross is not just a cool event that happened 2,000 years ago or some mythical event that happened. No, it is real. I want you to understand that Jesus' person was so huge in the world today that we literally changed our year and date because of it. The way we write down time, today the year is 2024 A.D., referring to the very day that Jesus changed the whole calendar because it was that important throughout the world. Today, you might be here because your friend brought you or maybe you're listening online and you're saying, I feel no hope. I want you to understand that the palm that you hold in your hand could be the worship that says, Lord, I surrender my heart to you today. I give my heart to you today, not in the way they did where they only wanted you to serve them. They put down their palms and they said, save now, because they had an idea of what God can do for them by getting them away from Rome. No, no, no. Can you say, Lord, take my heart. I surrender it all. As he said, if you want your life, you got to lose it. You got to put it down. If you would do me a favor, stand to your feet. Psalms 118 says this, Save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The terming in the beginning there is save now, Hosanna. Some of you, you need to declare save now, but not from Rome, but from your sin. Not from Rome, but your past, that you feel you're not worthy of forgiveness. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross. If you never step foot in a church again, if you never come back to this building again, I want you to know that Jesus went to Calvary's cross willingly. He went on Palm Sunday on a donkey for you that you might find forgiveness, that you might find hope and freedom. There is no such thing as hopeless. There is, some, there is no such thing as someone so lost they can't be found. Jesus did it all and he paid the price for you. So on this Palm Sunday, may you know that Jesus entered into Jerusalem to start off Passion Week for you. You were on his mind. You were on his mind. He forgives you. The Bible says if you repent and confess and believe, you will see the Lord. He is faithful and he is just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. So as the worship team leads us in song today, I pray that you would know that the God of heaven is for you and he's not against you. He loves you. There's no sin too bad, no past too great. The greatest thing you could ever do is accept Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior. Ask him to come into your heart. Ask him, Lord, I ask for forgiveness of my sin. And see, here's the greatest thing. When Jesus was on that cross, he uttered these words, it is finished. When translated out of the Greek, telestai, meaning debt paid in full. Your debt is paid in full. How many people would like to see that on your credit card statement? Some of you laughed a little too loud. We'll do Dave Ramsey in the summer again, okay? 
but your spiritual debt paid in full. The cost of your sin no longer applied to you. Debt paid in full because of Calvary's cross. Everybody where you are, would you close your eyes and bow your head? As we worship the Lord today, I'm going to ask you to worship the Lord with your heart and not just with your words. On this Palm Sunday, they declared save now because they wanted him to fix their earthly situation. Can you say save now because I want you to fix my spiritual situation?
this Palm Sunday, may you realize that Jesus entered into Jerusalem his final week for you. If you remember nothing from the sermon, remember this, that Jesus went for you. But the palm in your hand represent your worship. Is it a boomerang worship where it's really save me and it's all about what I want, save me from my situation, or is it, Lord, how can I serve you? So, Heavenly Father, today, oh Lord God, I pray on this Palm Sunday, Lord, we stop and we say thank you. Thank you for your broken body and shed blood for us. Lord God, we thank you, oh God, for your mercy and your grace. And today on this Palm Sunday, we give you all the praise and honor. And we all say amen and amen. On the way out, I'm going to ask everybody to grab one of those Easter cards. I want none left today. Everybody grab one. Give it to your Uber driver, your barista. Give it to your Lyft, whoever. Parents, if you're picking up your kids, please wait down here and check them out. Don't go upstairs. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his face on you and be gracious to you and bring you peace. God bless.